Thank you, uh, Frank. And I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel according to Matthew. We start a new series today, which will take us, uh, Lord willing, up through um, Easter, called New Code for Life. And it's a study that we're going to be do, doing on the Sermon of the, on the Mount. <clears throat> If you remember, when we started our Advent uh, series, uh, we read from the fourth chapter of Matthew, just the verses prior to that, where the people who were sitting in the land of Zebula and Natali were sitting in darkness. And the scriptures tell us, upon them a light dawned. And if you know anything about the Old Testament, when it ended with the book of Malachi, we have what we refer to as 400 years of silence. God does speak at various times in various ways. Um, it's all at his prerogative. And sometimes there are times of silence in your life and times of silence in my life. And so it was as the Old Testament ended. But at the end of Malachi, these verses are recorded for us. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah. Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore, note now, the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And upon that, we open then up the New Testament to the Gospel of Matthew. And I want you to watch just for a few moments an introduction uh, to the Gospel of Matthew put on by the Bible Project. I think it will give uh, a good background for where we'll be going in our study, even in the Sermon on the Mount. The Gospel according to Matthew. It's one of the earliest official accounts about Jesus of Nazareth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. The book itself is anonymous, but the earliest reliable tradition links it to Matthew the tax collector, who was one of the 12 apostles that Jesus appointed, and he actually appears within the book itself. For about 30 to 40 years, the apostles orally taught and passed on their eyewitness accounts about Jesus, along with his teachings that they had all memorized. And Matthew has then collected and arranged all these into this amazing, tapestry and design the book to highlight certain themes about Jesus. In this video, we're just going to cover the first half of the book. Specifically, Matthew wants to show how Jesus is the continuation and fulfillment of the whole biblical story about God and Israel. That Jesus is the Messiah from the line of David, that he is a new authoritative teacher like Moses, and not only that, Jesus is God with us, or in Hebrew, Emmanuel. And Matthew's designed this book with an introduction and then a conclusion, and these act like a frame around five clear sections right here in the center, each of which concludes with a long block of Jesus' teaching. Now this design is very intentional and it's amazing. Just watch how this works. Chapters 1 through 3, they set the stage by attaching Jesus' story right onto the storyline of the Old Testament scriptures. So Matthew opens with a genealogy about Jesus that highlights how he is from the messianic line of the son of David, and he's a son of Abraham. That means he's going to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. After that, we get the famous story about Jesus' birth and how all of the events fulfilled the Old Testament prophetic promises that the nations would come and honor the Messiah, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, but even more than that, Jesus' conception by the Holy Spirit, his name Emmanuel, all these work together to show that Jesus is no mere human. He is God with us. God become human. So you can see two of Matthew's key themes right here in the introduction. He's from the line of David. He's Emmanuel. But Matthew also wants to show how Jesus is a new Moses. So like Moses, Jesus came up out of Egypt he passed through the waters of baptism, and he entered into the wilderness for 40 days. And then Jesus goes up onto a mountain to deliver his new teaching. So through all of this, Matthew is claiming that Jesus is the promised greater than Moses figure who's going to deliver Israel from slavery. He's going to give them new divine teaching. He's going to save them from their sins and bring about a new covenant relationship between God and his people. 
This Moses and Jesus parallel also explains why Matthew has structured the center of the book the way that he did. These five main parts highlight Jesus as a teacher. And he's created a parallel. Jesus as a teacher parallels the five books of Moses. Jesus is the new authoritative covenant teacher who's going to fulfill the storyline of the Torah. Now in the first section, chapters 4 to 7, Jesus steps onto the scene announcing the arrival of God's kingdom. And this is really key. The kingdom is in essence about God's rescue operation for his whole world. And it's taking place through King Jesus. Jesus has come to confront evil, especially spiritual evil, and its whole legacy of demon oppression and disease and death. Jesus has come to restore God's rule and reign over the whole world by creating a new family of people who will follow him, obey his teachings, and live under his rule. So, after Jesus begins healing people and forming a movement, a community, he takes his followers out to a mountain or a hillside, and he delivers his first big block of teaching, traditionally called the Sermon on the Mount. And here Jesus explores what it looks like to follow him and live in God's kingdom. And it's an upside-down kingdom where there are no privileged members. So the poor, the nobodies, the wealthy, the religious, everybody is invited and is called to turn, to repent, and to follow. Follow Jesus and join his family. Jesus says that he's not here to set aside the commands of the Torah or the Old Testament. Rather, he's here to fulfill all of that through his life, through his teachings. He's here to transform the hearts of his people so that they can truly love God and love their neighbor, including their enemy. After concluding his great teaching on the kingdom, the next section shows Jesus bringing the kingdom into reality in the day-to-day -day lives of people. So Matthew's arranged here nine stories about Jesus bringing the power of God's kingdom into the lives of hurting, broken people. There are three groups of three stories, and they're all about people who are sick or have broken bodies or they're in danger, and Jesus heals or saves them by these acts of grace and power. And then right in between these triads, we find two parallel stories about Jesus' call that people should follow him. Matthew's making a point here. One can only experience the power of Jesus' grace by following him and becoming his disciple. So 2,000 years ago, by a sea called the Sea of Galilee, Jesus called the disciples. Follow me. And I'll do something with your life. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of women, fisher of boys, fisher of girl, girls. And what I long for us to see in the series that we're going through, especially in this introduction today, is the heart of the King, King Jesus, for his kingdom. Now, a lot of times when we think about a kingdom, we think of a geographical place. Uh, a king rules over a particular people, obviously, and over a certain geographical area. But what Matthew is going to talk about regarding the kingdom, it, 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 it's not some kingdom uh, regarding some space or anything like that, except the space in your heart and my heart. Because Matthew is going to say that the kingdom of God is within you. And that he longs for his kingdom, God does, to come into your heart and into my heart. And we're going to see Jesus living out all that we find here in the Sermon on the Mount perfectly for you and for me, thus him qualifying to be the Savior indeed of the world. Uh, if I asked you about life in Silicon Valley, uh, would you say that life in Silicon Valley is crazy? Life in Jesus' day was crazy. The Pharisees and Sadducees and those religious leaders had added so many other things onto the law of Moses, 613 different commandments that were there. They added to them, put heavy, heavy burdens on the people that they could never fulfill. So life was crazy, life was fuzzy, because it was hazy. Things were not clear. And Matthew now, as we start uh, this in the New Testament, clears things up. 
And one of the things, by the way, if you would read through uh, your outline for today uh, at some other time, it'll give you some insights into the whole study we're going to be doing through the gospel of, 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 of Matthew. But one of the things that Matthew is going to address is this. Does Jesus of Nazareth have the right to sit on the throne of David? See, in the Old Testament, God gave many different kinds of covenants. A covenant to Noah, a covenant to Abraham, a covenant to Moses, and one covenant that went to David, King David. That from his descendants, one is going to sit on the throne, and he is going to rule forever and ever and ever. And so Matthew is going to talk about King Jesus. He's going to mention, I think, the kingdom in this gospel 54 times. He's going to refer to Old Testament scriptures, I think, around 60 plus times. And so that the message that Jesus is going to deliver is not something like brand new, in a sense. No, as you saw in the little video, it's a continuation and fulfillment of God's total story from beginning Genesis 1-1 through Revelation chapter 22. So, if you could follow along in your outline, that would be very, very helpful. Chapter 3 begins with a story, scenario, a little historical account of John, who we refer to as the Baptist, but he's really the baptizer. And he lived out in what we refer to today as the Judean wilderness, as it was in that day. And people were coming to him. And here was his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see in chapter 4, if you look at verse 17 in your Bibles, From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same message. In fact, in the English Bible, I think it's exactly the same words. That the people were to repent. They were to change their minds. They were to move in a different direction. And so, Peter... Uh, uh, Frank read these scripture verses, if you would look again at verse 18 of chapter 4. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea where they were fishermen. And he said to him, them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so they began to follow. The Christian life as a follower of Jesus, begins with repentance. When we come to him just as we are, as we will see in the very first beatitude next Sunday, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You cannot get into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of heaven, unless you come just as you are and you confess your own spiritual inadequacies, your bankruptcy. And you come to him by faith. And so Jesus' message was, repent. And then it proceeds from there, in verse 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the scriptures tell us in verse 20, immediately they left their nets and they began to follow him. It begins with repentance. It is followed by obedience. And then it's a matter of training. If you look at verse 23, notice what Jesus was doing. He was going throughout all Galilee, and he was doing three things. He was teaching in their synagogues. He was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And he was healing, note, every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. 
So if you look at those three words, teaching, proclaiming, and healing, Jesus came to alleviate man's ignorance. And what Judaism had fallen into was nothing but rules and regulations and heavy burdens. And he is now going to explain really what the kingdom of God involves. So he comes to alleviate ignorance and he comes to clear up misunderstandings. That's what teachers do. And of course, no better teacher than the Lord Jesus himself, the master rabbi. And then he's going to relieve pain and he's going to relieve suffering. This is what is involved in when Jesus talks about how we are to live as his children in the kingdom of God. Now, I want to, to, to just give you a brief overview today of what I refer to as Jesus' kingdom followers. And you have in your outline there, um, well, there's some blanks there that you can fill in if, if you choose to do so. But one of the things that Jesus' followers do is they respond to King Jesus' invitation. Remember, his message was, repent, change your mind, and they were to come and to follow him, that we are to respond to the invitations that Jesus gives us. Here's the second thing. They were to embrace the virtues of the king. And so if you look at chapter 5, verse 1, it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, that's what rabbis did and how they taught, they would sit down. His disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he began to teach them, saying, and then what we have are these verses 3 to 12 that we refer to as the Beatitudes. And if you recall in the little introduction that we just saw, Jesus is talking about an upside-down kind of a kingdom where Jesus comes and he changes really the price tags of, of what was really important in the kingdom of God. And so he starts out, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are gentle, blessed are those, and so forth. He's talking about how to experience a life that's fulfilled, a life that is filled with joy, a life that is, uh, well, some translations would say happy, happy are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so we are to embrace the virtues of the king. What does a Jesus follower look like? Well, these Beatitudes explain it. And Jesus is going to model this and live this out perfectly during his first 30 years of his life and now as he begins his ministry for the next three, three and a half years. So we are to embrace the virtues. We are to pursue righteousness passionately. If you look down, he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees, they said one thing and they practiced something completely different. They were not pursuing Jesus as, or, or they, they were not responding to him and they were not living out what the Old Testament law was even teaching them. They were to pursue righteousness passionately. Number four, they were to avoid the dangers of superficiality. If you look in chapter six, he's going to talk about some practices regarding a spiritual life. And he's going to talk about fasting and he's going to talk about uh, giving. And he's going to talk about praying. And he's going to tell them that they are to do these things in secret. Because God then will reward those who do this. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all the religious leaders were always doing things out in the open to be noticed by men. And so Jesus says, don't be like them. No, you are to do things 
in secret so your Father will reward you. Kingdom followers seek the treasures that are eternal. Look with you, if you would, in chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. As kingdom followers, we're to be seeking the things that last. We're to be seeking the eternal. We're to be seeking the king and his kingdom. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. And then we are to adopt Jesus' upside-down kingdom. And he's going to tell us some things in here that we are not to do. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold the log that is in your own eye, you hypocrite? And so he's going to talk in these verses here about this Upside down kind of a kingdom and how we are to live. And then lastly, and just in terms of an overview, we are to enthrone Jesus as king in our hearts and in our lives. I want you to look at verse 24. This is concluding his teaching here, and this is what he's going to say. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, they all heard them, whether it's at one sitting or it's a combination of what Jesus taught, and acts upon them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, ah, uh, Kurt, do you have some water? Because, uh, I'm sorry, I, I think that I'm going to pass out for some reason. I just want you to follow along here. Um, yeah, I've never had this in all these uh, 40-some years of teaching and preaching where uh, I've had this break out. Honestly, I would have to say that uh, probably it's a spiritual battle. Because we're talking in the sermon in the series on the Mount, uh, Sermon on the Mount, of, of these paradoxical kind of things and the conflicting kingdoms that we see. And throughout the Gospel of Matthew, um, Matthew is going to talk about the kingdom of darkness, and he's going to be talking about the kingdom of light. He's going to be talking about binding the strong man. You can't go in to a household unless you first uh, 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 bind him. And I could tell from the time I got up this morning just right here to preach, I could feel um, something that I hadn't felt before in terms of oppression or whatever. And, and so, um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for your prayers. And what Jesus wants us to do is to enthrone him as Lord, as Master, as King into our hearts, into our lives. And that we are to build our lives. Notice what he says there. It's not just important enough to hear the words, but we are to act upon them. And then we are to build we're to build our lives on a solid foundation. And so Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act is going to be stupid, going to be foolish. Because they built their house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the, the winds blew and slammed against that house and it was great and great was its fall. 
And when he had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he's teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And by the way, when it says, when Jesus had finished these words, there are, there's an outline that I have for you in the introduction to the Gospel of Matthew. And every time you see these, when Jesus had finished these words, it starts a new section in his teaching throughout the Gospel of Matthew. So what Jesus is going to do now, remember, he's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, he's teaching and he's healing every kind of disease, and now in chapters 8 and 9 and 10, as was described for you in the little overview of the gospel of Matthew, Jesus is going to begin to do exactly what he said he was going to do. He was healing every kind of disease, and we're going to see it now in beginning in chapter 8. Look, if you would, in chapter 8, verse 1. And he's going to demonstrate exactly who he is as the king. The king over everything, over everyone, over every kind of disease, every kind of sickness, every kind of demonic power. That he is the cleanser of the unclean. People like you and me. And so you see this historic account here of a leper. Who comes to him and verse 3 says, or verse 2, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing to be cleansed, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus touched the untouchable. He wants to touch your life in areas where you don't think anybody knows about. Any issues that you might have, anything that you're hiding before a holy and righteous God, don't do that. Just come as you are, like the leper came. And he cries out for mercy, and he's healed. Here's the second thing that you see in verses 5 to 13. There's a centurion. He's not a a Jewish man. No, he's he's a military kind of fellow. And he has a servant that's at home paralyzed. And Jesus uh, says, I will come and heal him, verse 7. The centurion says, I'm not worthy. That's how you get into the kingdom of God, when you confess that you're not worthy. He's lying sick at home. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I'm a man under authority. And I say to this one, go and he goes, come and he comes, do this and he does it. And Jesus says, I've not found such great faith in all of Israel. And his servant was healed at that very hour. I don't know what has got you paralyzed, what kind of issues you have in your life that you're struggling with where you feel like you're bound, but he's the one who can can break all of those. Then he's the physician of the sick. Not as serious perhaps, but if you look in verse 14, Peter's mother-in-law is at home. She's lying sick in bed with a fever. And now this is the second time where you find this word uh, touched in the, in the NASB that I have. And the fever left her immediately. You move on down to verse 23. Jesus is putting all these things, or Matthew is, together to show who Jesus is. And that he is the one who can come and deliver us from whatever fears whatever things that we have in our hearts and in our lives. And so he puts the disciples, notice this, Jesus got into the boat with his disciples. One place it tells us that he made his disciples get into a boat, and he knows exactly what's going to happen. He causes a storm to take place on the sea, and verse 25, they came to him and woke him where he was sleeping. But he knew exactly what was going on. They say, save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you men of little faith? He got up, he rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. Got any fears? Fears of the future, fear in your relationships, 
fear of what's going on in the world, of what might happen now in the, in the Middle East with the stock market, don't worry about it. He's the consoler, the comforter of those of us who have all of these fears in our lives. He can rebuke those things. And it became perfectly calm. He's the deliverer of the tormented. If you look in verse 28, from 28 to 34, we have this story of this man who is called Legion. And he's filled with all of these different demons. And Jesus, all he says to the demons in verse 32 is, Go! And they came out and they went into the swine and they all went over the hill. I don't know what torments you, what you're struggling with. But our king can deliver you. He's the forgiver of the guilty. There's a paralyzed guy. They let him down through the roof. And Jesus says to him, verse 2, Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. And he forgives this guy who's, who's paralyzed. He's the lover of the unlovely. Look at verse 20. There's a woman who's been suffering with the hemorrhage for 12 years. A slow ooze of, of, of perhaps blood. And she says this, If I just touch the fringe of his garment, I will be healed. And she touched the fringe of his garment and she was healed immediately. And Jesus says, Your faith has made you well. This woman was an untouchable. You couldn't touch a woman who had an issue of blood. Her husband couldn't even touch her or do anything with her if she was married indeed. He's the reviver of the dead. Jesus had initially gone before this woman touched him in the crowd. A synagogue official by the name of Jairus had come and his 12-year-old daughter had died. And so Jesus goes. And in verse 23, it says, When Jesus came into the official's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in a noisy disorder, he said, Leave, for the girl has not died but is asleep. And all Jesus says to her is, Arise, and she arises from the dead. And lastly, in this ninth chapter, he's the enlightener of the blind. In verse 27, as Jesus went on, two blind men, they cry out, have mercy on us. And he entered the house, and the blind man came up to him, and Jesus said to him, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith, and their eyes were opened. And I pray that as we go through this series on the Sermon on the Mount, that our eyes would be opened and that we would live by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Sermon on the Mount, in a daily basis. With our words, with our thoughts, with our actions. It's not literally a, a, a new code for, for living, in a sense. No, it's just the way that man from the get-go was supposed to live before the fall. And I would encourage you, I would challenge you, I would exhort you to read the Sermon on the Mount uh, every day. I've read it for five straight days and even days before. It'll take you 13 to 14 minutes to do it. And I leave and I close with, <clears throat> with this this morning. The statement by C.S. Lewis and then a prayer for all of us. C.S. Lewis says, it's a magician's bargain. Give up your soul, get power in return. But once our souls, that is ourselves, have been given up, the power thus conferred will not belong to us. We shall in fact be the slaves and puppets of that to which we have given our souls. Your most important possession is your soul. That's all you have. Give it up to this one who can change you from the inside out in your life. And I close <clears throat> uh, with this. 
the disciples ask Jesus two main things in his whole ministry with them. Increase our faith and teach us to pray. And you're all familiar with with the prayer if you've been in church at all. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, and so forth. And I had this, this prayer that I thought that, well, a prayer for myself as we begin this study, but a prayer for all of us as his people, as his family. Our Father in heaven, I desire to honor your name above all others. I long for your kingdom. Remember, that's his rule in your heart, to come at deeper levels in my heart. I enthrone you afresh, Jesus, as king in my heart and yearn to treasure Christ more than anyone or anything. Friends, he's the pearl of great price. And if you would just give him your attention, and if you would behold him in the pages of Scripture, you will find him so attractive, so irresistible. There was nothing in his bodily form that you would be attracted. He had no stately form or majesty that we would look upon him or appearance that we would be attracted to him. It was who he was in his nature, in his life, in his love for people. In, in his obedience to his Father who art in heaven. Let's say this together as we leave today. Our Father in heaven, I desire to honor your name above all others. I long for your kingdom to come at deeper levels in my heart. I enthrone you afresh, Jesus, as king in my heart and yearn to treasure Christ more than anyone or anything. And we are to do it for Jesus' sake. Hey, don't, don't worry about me. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be all right. Uh, sorry uh, about this. Uh, but um, you know what? We're pretty fragile people, aren't we? <laughs> and uh, frail and so forth at times. But um, thank you. I, I, I honestly do uh, long for you to read through the Sermon on the Mount and that by God's power and God's strength that we live it out for His glory. God bless you as you go. Greet those around you.